in keeping with the most wonderful time of the year, I want to do a series in the lead up to the Christmas season called For Unto Us. Called For Unto Us. Everyone say, For Unto Us. For Unto Us. To us, And uh, I want to read from a passage of Scripture in the Old Testament based upon a prophecy Isaiah gave some 700 years before Jesus was born. And it's found in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. And you'll soon see where I got the title of this series from the moment I start reading this passage of Scripture. Some of you theologians and scholars out there may know where I'm going with this, but it says this in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, reading from the Living Bible. I don't often do that, but this, this is great. It says, For unto us a child is born. Selah, think about that for a moment. A child is born. Then it says, Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And these will be, I love this, the royal titles. Wonderful. Ever say wonderful? wonderful. Counselor. Say counselor. counselor. The mighty God. Say the mighty God. The, mighty God. the everlasting Father. Yeah. And the Prince of Peace. Fantastic. This prophecy, as I've already mentioned, was written some 700 years before his birth. And it was written in a great time of turmoil and a season of fear. I, I don't know, but uh, the season of turmoil and fear sounds a lot like today. And this was a season that Israel were experiencing great fear, great turmoil. And there was this bold statement coming from a prophet saying, there is to be a son that is gonna be born. And this child will not be any ordinary child. And he declared with great confidence and great boldness, this child shall be a gift from God. Now, I just wanna say every child is a gift from God. Every child is a miracle, amen? If you've ever been part of the birthing process, I've been in three times, I've been seen the birthing process and, and it's, it's messy. It is messy, I'll give you that. No one tells you just how messy it is. Uh, but it's also a miracle. It's a, it's a messy miracle, that's what it is. Every birth is a messy miracle. But, but this, was, this, was, this was even greater than that. This, this prophet was saying, there's gonna be something extra special about this child. He's a gift from God. And this child is not only from God, but it's for us. This child is not only a gift from God, but it's a gift from God for you. And I think I say this pretty much every Christmas season. I've been doing this thing a long time now. I think this, is now, this will be my 28th Christmas leading this church. And I think every year I've said this, the message of Christmas is simple. It's this, that you matter to God. You matter to God so much that God gave heaven's best for you. Turn to the person next to you and say, for you. And turn to your second choice and say, and you. Turn the person behind you and say, and you too. That's getting messy, isn't it? And this prophecy lists several names that this Messiah child was to be called. Now, I don't know you, but let's be honest, picking a name for a child can be stressful. Parents, can I get a yes and can I get an amen? And I'll tell you why it's stressful, because there are certain rules when it comes to picking names for kids. There are certain rules that no one ever tells you about when it comes to picking names. For example, you can't name a child with the same name as someone you once dated. <laughs> Write that down, this is revelation. You can't do that. Can you imagine all the stories I've told about Meredith? My year four crush. You imagine if I gave birth or Kath gave birth, I said, let's call her Meredith. Kath would go, why? <laughs> what, 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 what undressed issue are you, what, what, what are you still carrying? You can't do that. So if you've ever had a, a girl or a guy by a certain name, it's off the list. You can't go there, write it down. It's a revelation. We like to be practical here at Life Adelaide, so write that down. It may save your relationships, it just might. You can't do that. Um, what else can't you do? You can't name a child after that annoying kid at school. You know that annoying kid at school and he went by a certain name for me, and, and no offence to the person in this room today with this name, if you're here or watching online, God bless you. But for me, I could never name a kid Troy, ever. 
And if you are a Troy, God loves you. I'm struggling with you, but God loves you, no. <laughs> the reason I, I could never name a child Troy is because when I was in junior primary, Troy didn't know how to spell his name. And every time he saw my book with my name on it, Tony, he thought that was his book. And every day throughout the whole year, like year one, he just kept taking my I said, Troy, that's my book. And he goes, no, it's mine. Look, Troy. I said, no, that's Tony. Gee, you're annoying, Troy. In next fact, I can't even use the name Troy. If I see a Troy, I call him T-Roy. I can't even associate Troy. Again, watching online, if there's any, I know there's a few Troys in our church. I love you, I do. And God loves you. Just don't like your name. Just too much stress and pressure. But anyway, see, you can't, you can't do that. Uh, what else can't you do? Um, you can't name a child after the teacher you didn't like. Isn't that right, Vicky Jones? <laughs> Katie Roberts. These, these are great teachers. These, these are. But, but you, 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 could never, you could never do that. Um, you also have to think about the first name and the last name and how they go together. That's, that's a big one. You can't call uh, a, a, your daughter Eileen if your last name is right. <laughs> well, you can, but poor girl is going to suffer for the rest of her life. In actual fact, uh, we have Rick Wright on the front row, but what you don't know about Rick Wright is his middle name is always. Rick always right. <laughs> no. <laughs> is that right? Is that right, Leone? At least that's what he thinks anyway. Um, <laughs> Teresa Green can't do that. Lowest Price can't do that. For, for, for Kath and I... For Kath and I, I personally love the name Sky. But when you got the name Rainbow, it's just like, uh, hippie commune weirdo. So Sky was, I, I love Sky. It's such a beautiful name. Couldn't do that. Because when you've got a, and this is what I, if you've got a hero of a last name like we do, Rainbow's, you know, people have to, everywhere I travel around the world, they say, is that your real name? <laughs> it's my real name. Do you think I'd choose that? But anyway, it's my real name. Uh, yeah, no, and I love the name Noah. We, 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 we'd love to have called our child Noah. I would have dropped the H, N-O-A, Noah. Great name, but Noah Rainbow. It's just, uh, the kid's going to get beaten up at school. Your dad's a pastor. Ooh, just like, it's just <laughs> such a Christian. You, know, you don't want to do that. So, I mean, we, there are so many great names. You've got you to think about that. You've got to think about that. And sometimes when you've had a great first uh, child, you've got a great name like, like Goldie Wild. I know there's pressure on the Dwyers right now because I've gone on about their child's name so much. I just love their name, Goldie Wild. They feel the pressure now to come up with a better name than that. And so there's, there's all these pressures when it comes to picking names. But all jokes aside, all jokes aside, names have a great deal of meaning. There's a lot of thought and effort given into names because names are important. Would that be fair to say? Yeah. Having said that, as much as we value names today, I want you to know there's, this is nothing in comparison to the way names meant back in Hebrew culture, particularly in the Old Testament. When they named their child, it meant something. We see that Adam was named, the first man on the planet, Adam. What does it mean? It means earth. Eve, mother of all the living. Abraham, the father of nations. Isaac, laughter. All these names revealed something about the person. And this prophecy reveals something about the character and the nature of Jesus, this Messiah that was to be born. Isaiah wanted to try to help us to understand something of the character and the nature of this yet to be born child. And the prophecy starts with this first name. And the first name that this child shall be known as is Wonderful. Can you say it with me? Wonderful. And wonderful, as wonderful, He deals with the dullness of our lives. He deals with the boredom of our lives. He deals with the mundaneness of our lives. And if ever there was a generation that needs the boredom and the dullness dealt with, it's this generation. And we have an opportunity to present Mr. Wonderful to the world. And His name is Jesus. He's wonderful. The word wonderful is the Hebrew word Pele, like the soccer player, Pele. And as good as Pele was at soccer, 
Jesus is far more wonderful. It means beyond understanding. It means too wonderful for words. You see, Isaiah didn't have the words to describe this Saviour that was to be born. He struggled, as I do, trying to describe the One who is indescribable. That's what's going on here. He used a word that means there is no words. There is no words great enough to tell you how awesome He is. He's too wonderful for words. He's something astonishing. He's an act of God. He's no ordinary child. He's out of this world and He'll blow your minds. This is the Saviour that we worship and serve. And Christmas is a wonderful time to remind us here at Life Adelaide that He is wonderful. Amen. We sang a song this morning and I wanna just read these words to you from the song that we sang and it's called, Oh The Wonder. And we may sing it a little bit later on in the service, I'm not sure, but it says, I'm a dead man walking until you breathe. Let these words sink in. Sometimes we just sing words and we we don't get the meaning of them. But He says, I was a dead man walking. I was a dead man walking. You were a dead man walking until He breathed. My heart came alive, came alive for the first time. I was once a prisoner but now I'm free. I don't know about you, but I feel so alive. So alive for the first time. Oh, the wonder, the awesome wonder. We sang that this morning. Did you know that? Or we just, I don't know what that was. I just, I don't know what that was. Praise the one who took these chains from me. You bought my freedom. What are you doing with your freedom, church? Thank you, Jesus. I don't know about you, because He bought my freedom, that's why I come to church to say thank you every week. Not to use my freedom, not to come to church because I don't have to. That's an abuse of the freedom that we have. The freedom we have, we should come to church to say, thank you, Jesus, for the freedom that I have because of you. You bought my freedom. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, the wonder of your, oh, sorry, of your love for me. I can't even say it, let alone sing it. I've got joy. Anyone got joy this morning? I've got joy that's found in a heavenly hope. Not a joy found in the circumstance and the situations that are here today, gone tomorrow, but I've got joy found in the heavenly hope. Peace like a river down in my soul. I'm held by the power of the Holy Ghost. Can I have an amen, brother? Hallelujah. I mean, come on. I love the Lord. If loving the Lord is wrong, I don't wanna be right. That's not in the song. I'm just gonna, that's just, that's just my love for movies. That's all that is anyway. <laughs> I think the weight of my hair is just affecting my brain today. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Anyway, oh, the wonder. If you've tasted the goodness of His grace, if you've been redeemed by the power of His name, then shake these walls with a shout of praise. Oh, what a wonder, what a wonder. Church, never, please, never lose the wonder. Never lose the wonder. Stay in love with Jesus. I remember when I was 19 years of age, having a conversation with someone who's 32. And when you're 19, 32 is old. Now it's very young for me. Man, 32 is like 20 years ago. It's just crazy. For Leone, it's 21 years ago. Anyway, we celebrated Leone's birthday yesterday. Anyway, I'm so much younger than her. So much younger. So much younger. And I'll never forget getting this conversation. They say, oh, when you're our age, and I'm not saying what I said was right. I'm not saying I did it with the best attitude, but I still believe what I said as a 19-year-old kid. I said, when I'm your age, I'll never be like you. Because what they had wasn't an age thing, it was an attitude thing. And I want to encourage you, never lose the wonder. 
I tell, I tell every young couple that get married, never come off your honeymoon. Stay in love with this person that you marry for the rest of your life. Keep, keep romancing each other. You know, what you did to get the girl is what you've got to do to keep the girl. Let's write that down, boys. Wondering why your relationship's not working. What you did to get the girl. Remember you used to have a shower, you used to put on deodorant, remember all those things? Keep doing that. You might just keep the girl. And what you did when you first gave your life to Jesus, keep doing that. Remember when you used to read your Bible every day? Remember when you used to pray every day? Remember when you used to go to church every day? Remember when you come down the front and worship Jesus? Remember when you pray often? Those things, keep doing that. Don't let life get the better of you. Don't let life knock the stuffing out of you. That's what church is all about. We come and get refreshed. We come and get blessed. That's why I believe the church should gather together because we have an opportunity to refresh and bless one another and remind each other what an incredible, wonderful God we serve. Amen. Never lose your first love. He is wonderful. Not only is He wonderful, but He's counsellor. He is counsellor. And as counsellor, He deals with the decisions of our life. As wonderful, He deals with the dullness of our lives, but as counsellor, He deals with the decisions of our life. The word counsellor is the Hebrew word yoaz, and it means to advise, to consult and to guide. And you might say, oh, that sounds like a counsellor I know. But I want you to know, whatever counsellor you're seeing or have seen, and as good as they may be, Jesus is far more wonderful. He, he lacks no wisdom. His understanding is beyond our understanding. And He takes any human counselling to a whole nother level. And as counsellor, I want you to know a few things. One, He's, He cares about what you're going through. He cares about you. And He cares about the things that you are facing right now. One of our precious members, Connie, woke up to the news that her mum had passed away in Greece. She couldn't even be with her. Horrible. But I want you to know, Connie, God cares. And to the Everett family, God cares and He knows what you're going through right now. He cares for you. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, Be humble in the presence of God's power and He will honour you when the time comes. God cares for you. So turn all your worries over to Him. Church, this Messiah that Isaiah prophesied about was one that would care for you in every circumstance and situation, in your pain and in your suffering and in your problems. He is there and He cares for you. Amen. Not only does He care for you, but He also identifies with what you're going through. He identifies. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathise with us in our weakness, but we have one who, uh, who in every respect has been tempted in every way as we are, and yet is without sin. This is good news. Jesus has been through what you are going through. He's faced what you are facing. I've been betrayed. Jesus was betrayed. I've been abandoned. Jesus was abandoned. I've been beaten up. Jesus was beaten up. Jesus was tempted and tested in every way as you and I are. He knows what you're going through. He's felt your pain firsthand, personally. He knows, He feels. He's not a God who's far off. He loved us so much that He came to experience what you and I go through that He could identify. He understands your hurt. But like, unlike anyone else in this room, he never sinned. He never let his experiences, he never let his hurt, he never let his pain get the better of him. He was always in control. He always had the upper hand. And he's able to help you stay in control. He's able to help you get the upper hand. He cares for you, he identifies you. And also as counsellor, he is able to help you in what you're going through. He's able to help you in what you're going through. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18 says it this way, because he himself has suffered when tempted. He's able to help those who are also being tempted. See, he not only understands, but he can help. He can help. He can help you. He can help me. He can help us in our situation. And I want to encourage you not to run away, not to give up, not to give in. Jesus modelled something so beautiful in the Garden of Gethsemane. When He was facing the cross and, and, and His humanity, His humanity wanted to run. In His humanity, He said, if, if there's another way, Father, yet not my will, but Yours be done. 
And he receives strength. He receives focus. He receives vision. He received understanding. He received everything he needed for that moment. And when you feel like running, and when you feel like giving up, I want you to know when you feel like running and giving up, that doesn't make you a bad person. That just makes you a person. There's not a person in this room who hasn't felt like giving up and giving in and running from time to time. But he's the one who can help us stand and not run, but walk through the fire. Sometimes we are delivered from the fire and we love those moments. But sometimes he gives us strength to help us through the fire. And both are ways in which he comes to help us and meet us where we are. Amen. And the third thing this morning is when it comes to his names, he is almighty God. And as almighty God, he deals with the demands of our lives. The demands of our lives. The Hebrew translation for almighty God is El Gaibor. El Gaibor. El means God and Gaibor, get this, means hero. I love this. He is God, our hero. He is hero God. The good news is that we don't have a weak, insipid God. We don't have a God carved from stone or wood. We have a God who is a divine hero. I don't know if you've ever played those games, who's stronger, who would win a fight? Would it be Spider-Man or would it be the Hulk? You ever done those games where which one would win? You ever done those things? No, just me. Come on, come on. But I want you to know, Jesus trumps everyone and everything. He wins. I've read the end of the Bible and I've learned this, that in Christ, we win. He's our hero God. In Jeremiah 32, verse 17, it says, Ah, Sovereign Lord, You have made the heavens and the earth by Your great power and Your outstretched arm. Nothing, get this, nothing, nothing, nothing is too hard for You. Nothing is too hard for you. So how does He help us deal with the demands of life? I'm so glad you asked. Three things and then we're done. Number one, by working in you. He wants to work in you. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13 says it this way. It is God who works in you both to will and to do the work for His good pleasure. See, you, like my hair, may not be where you want it to be right now, But thank God it's not where it was. You are a work in progress. You are under construction. You're under construction. You're not finished. God's not done with you yet. I mentioned recently we've moved to the beach. But the three months that we've been down there, we have not been down there without experiencing roadworks because the connector that joins this church to our house is being relayed with tar. And it it slows things down. And when I'm in a hurry, it's like we're going 40 and I wouldn't mind 40 if people went 40, but people go 25 in a 40 zone. I'm like, come on, people. Some of us have a life to live. Some of us have a purpose to fulfil. Come on, go 41 at least, come on. And so every day for the last three months, under construction, men at work. And I cannot tell you the amount of times the, the, the workers have walked out in the middle of the road but there's coming a day in Jesus name play where that road will be complete and the thing that gets me through it you know what gets me through it is the little bits that have been done it's like so smooth it's all And so if you're going through an under construction moment right now, hold on to the good. Just remember the smooth, oh, it's nice. And just as I'm getting used to this nice, you have to stop. Guy with his lollipop, stop. You're not finished. God's working in you. And through this crazy season, what's happening? You are. What's going on? You are. God, what's the point? I love you. I love you too much to leave you as you are. I'm growing you, changing you. Still dealing with that impatience in you, Tony. Ah, what impatience? Oh, that, oh, I got it. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Hey. It works in you. He's a hero God, not only because He works in us, but He's working for you. Whatever you're going through, know this, God is for you. He's on your side. 
You know what? I said something a long time ago. That I believe my worst day with God is better than my best day without Him. I never forget that crazy year, 2016, and I'm fighting for my life. Pastor Danny's coming in to see me every day. He's bringing me soup and pasta and trying to build me up because I'm losing weight by the day. And I just feel like, uh. But I remember even at my weakest, even at my weakest, I knew God was for me. And I thought, I'd rather be in this deathbed. I'd rather be in this bed near death with God. Because church, without eternity, this life doesn't even make sense. If this life is all about this life, it doesn't make sense. But when you add eternity to the equation, and I would rather go to be with Jesus in my sickness than live a few short years in good health and, 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 and lose my eternity. Eternity is the only thing that makes sense to me. And I know this, that God is working all things together for good because He's a God who is for me. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 says it this way. My grace is sufficient for you. For my prayer is made perfect in weakness. Paul says, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my what? Weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. I know life's not always easy. I know stuff happens, which is the Christian way of saying the other thing. It happens. It happens. Stuff happens. But know this, in the happenings, God is for you. God's working in you. God's working for you. And God is also working through you. See, this life is not all about you. We've seen this year others. It's not all about you. It's about others. His power is available not only for you, but to work through you. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we read, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the most ends of the world. See, God's power isn't just for you. He wants us to help others. Can you please turn to the person next and say, others? Can you do that? Others? Others matter? This life is not just about you and yours. There's a hurting world out there. They need your help. He's given us the ability to help others. And as the band come up, I want to remind you that you might have demands on your life, but others have demands on their life. And God has put you in their world. I said last week, I don't mean to be controversial, but we don't want to build a little commune and grow vegetables and, and, and look after bees. That, that's not the mission. The mission is to actually get in the marketplace where the people are and to help others. Yesterday was an incredible display of what I'm talking about. For people to be able to rock up so early and work so diligently and so effectively for a common cause and a common purpose, to make sure that 2,500 Christmas boxes were packed. And they weren't just packed, they were packed with care. And Crystal and the team were watching, no, 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 move that there. No, you've got to put that there. We want people to get excellence. Yeah, yeah. The little nick in the box, no, not good enough. Don't want a nick in the box. We want people to receive the best. And I, can, I know I speak on behalf of every volunteer. There was sweat, there was, there was sore backs today. There, there's somebody right here, they're probably in bed. Just, oh. But man, there's this, there's this resonating on the inside. Wow. What an incredible privilege to be able to serve others. God wants to help you, not just for you, but for others. Everything Jesus did was for others. He didn't come to planet Earth to show off. He came for others. He left the splendour of heaven to come and help us. We were lost, blind. We had no hope. And so Jesus, I'll come. The Bible says all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. We don't measure up to our own standards. We all have high standards. Let's be honest, we don't even measure up to our own standards, let alone God's holy standard. We all fall short of that. And so God devised a plan from the very beginning of time. Our humanity and our sin did not take God by surprise. Jesus was the plan from the very beginning of time. And He came some 2,000 years ago. I imagine the Father and the Son consulting in heaven saying, now's the time. It's always been the plan, but now's the time. And some 2,000 years ago, in a little town called Bethlehem, the Saviour was born. This wonderful Counselor, mighty God, came into the world, changed the world forever.
I don't know about you, I'm grateful for Jesus. I'm 52 years of age and I hope and pray I can preach and pray and speak like this at 82. And if I get to 102, I want to preach and preach. I don't want to get bitter. I want to get better. Give me another 20 years of reading God's Word. It should equal greater gratitude, greater wonder. Not stale, boring, pathetic. Come on, the world needs you. They need you in love with Jesus. No, I won't go to church. I remember one day I had this demonic thought. I'm sitting there in my new house at the beach. I thought, I think I'll watch church online today. Tony says, you can't, you're preaching. I said, oh, okay, better go. (laughs) You need people in your world to say, hey, come on, stay on course. Stay on course. As wonderful, He deals with the dullness of life. If your Christianity is getting dull and boring, come on, fire up. Fire up. If your Christianity is boring, that's on you. It's not the pastor's fault. I refuse to own that. It's not your home group leader's fault. It's not your wife's fault. It's not your kid's fault. Come on, fire up. As counsellor, He deals with the decisions of our life. And as mighty God, He deals with the demands of our life. And there's a few more names we're going to look at in the next couple of weeks. Hope you're excited. Hope that's worth turning out for. Hope that's worth getting excited about.